Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening to Killer Queens. Or KQ if you're nasty. Welcome to the show where two 90s loving country chicks gab about true crime and tell each other to talk to the hand because the face ain't listening. I'm Torella. And I'm Tori. And we're sisters who have always loved true crime and decided to turn that obsession into a show with a light take on the topic. Kind of like diet true crime, it's all the flavor and fewer calories. Mm. Now with our show, you'll get true crime, 90s nostalgia, and a few four-letter words sprinkled in. Because I always say that Polly Pockets and true crime go together like peas and carrots. Be sure to check out our case submission form on our website at killerqueenspodcast.com and follow us on social media and YouTube. Now grab your Surge, your 3D Cool Ranch Doritos, and your kitten surprise, and let's get into the episode. This episode contains discussion of murder of child and adult, kidnapping children and adult, sexual assault of a child, sexual assault of adults, and talks of coercive control. Listener discretion is advised. Judith and Alvin Neely began their marriage with a life of petty crimes and motel living, but after a brief separation due to incarceration, the couple's desire for committing crimes worsened. Judy and Alvin began hatching plans to abduct and kill young women after seeking revenge on those Judy claimed to have hurt her. Okay, two things. If this ain't a case of beer-flavored nipples... I know. ...meets ya dumb bitch, (laughs) I don't know what is. Yeah. Okay? And I'm ashamed to say that she's from our neck of the woods. I know. (laughs) But um, before we get into that, we have to thank Tory Brothers for requesting this. I really did. Yes, I really, really did. OMG. I know. Um, thanks, girl. And then uh, thanks to Beth for writing this one up. Yay. Thank you. Yay. All right. So, so let us discuss, shall we? Yeah. Judith Ann Adams was born on June 7th, 1964 in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Her mom was a housewife, and people called her Judy. So uh, her mom was a housewife. Her father worked as both a carpenter and a construction worker. And she had two older siblings, a sister named Dottie and a brother named James. Everybody called him Jimbo because Tennessee. Uh, (laughs) Then after she was born, two more brothers followed. That's Bill and Davey. So this is uh, the Adams family. Oh, (laughs) da-na-na-na, da-na-na-na. Yeah, I won't do the whole. Thing, oh, okay, yes. okay, all right, yeah. Um, so the Adams family was no, not no, no, no. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> was not considered a rich or a poor family. You know, they it was a pretty good upbringing. Like they had what they needed, they had what they wanted. I mean, you know, yeah. after they came home from school every day, they could go outside. You know, play with the neighborhood kids. It was a safe area, like all this stuff. In 1973, Judy's father started his own construction company and their income increased. And people did say that her father uh, drank some, but reportedly never abused or spoke harshly to Judy or anyone in the family, it seemed like. It seemed like it was a a really good environment to grow up in. You don't hear about that often when we're talking about the people that we're talking about. Exactly. You know? It's very surprising mm-hmm. that it was like your run of the mill, you know, like average good family. Yeah, exactly. The Christmas of that year, Judy got a dolly with a string to make it speak named Drowsy mm. and a red toy keyboard. And these two oh. items stayed with her. Uh, as the years passed, she did not want to part with them as her father had helped her open and play with them that Christmas morning. So when Judy was nine in March of 1974, Judy's father hopped on his motorcycle after drinking and drove into a guardrail on the highway. He ended up riding it for 100 feet before he was spun into the air and came back down hitting the pavement. Jeez. Goodness gracious. I don't know this, but there were no laws for helmets at that time. I assume he probably wasn't wearing one. You know, it's just, man, that sounds terrible. Mm -hmm. After her father's death, the family life that Judy had known literally just disappeared. Her mom started meeting men over a CB radio and then would invite them over for sex. That's like, that's a hard turn. Yeah. 
Mrs. That's Adams. like the seventies uh, era of Tinder. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What? How do? You, what do you say on a CB radio? The extent of my knowledge on the CB radio situation is from Candy Cane. Yeah. So do so. you just go on there and you're like, "Hey, who wants to fuck?" I don't. <laughs> What do you... Anybody DTF? Yeah, like, I don't... What do you say for that? I don't know. I don't know. ASL. And mm. then that's how you start it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's Judy. Alvin Neely was born on July 15th, 1953 in Tryon, Georgia. Is that right? right? Sure. Okay. He had... Go ahead and try it on. Oh, Tryon. Okay. okay. He had two older siblings who were immediately charmed by him. He was the little baby. As he grew up, he was not only charming, but he was a jokester and a prankster. What a silly guy. What a silly little guy. The um the reading thing that I use for the scripts. Mm-hmm. Does, I can't physically read myself. She <laughs> said he was a jokester and a prankster. I was like, what is a <laughs> jokester? And I was like, oh, <laughs> idiot. Um, I love it. He was a popular kid and everyone in the neighborhood wanted to play with him. He was in the Boy Scouts. He enjoyed hunting, fishing, learning how to tie knots. He was the class clown from the very, I almost said the very fart of his school days. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with me? You're a jokester too, I a know. jokester. Tell me you have two boys who say fart 50,000 times a day without telling me you have two boys that say that. Okay, wow. The very <laughs> fart of his school days. Goodness. <laughs> from the very start of his school days and particularly liked to pick on the girls. As Alvin grew up, though, he turned into a petty criminal. He had a habit of stealing cars. Jeez. I think that's like a notch above petty, but... I would say so. <laughs> like, I'm thinking petty <laughs> criminal is like... Stealing candy from the candy exactly. store. Exactly. And yeah. he's like, yeah, I just sometimes steal cars. That's like... <laughs> that's like less... Grand Theft Auto, hello. I know. Like, that's kind of a big deal. Yeah. But Alvin was described as someone who didn't want to live a regular life. He was very excited by the idea of committing what he considered to be petty crimes. He met his first wife, Joanne Browning, in 1973. Okay. So now they're going to come together. Judy is 15 at this point. She meets Alvin during one of her sexual encounters. I don't know the story here, but. Okay. Alvin said he absolutely fell in love with her the minute he saw her. Okay. And the same was true for Judy. They saw each other and it was like close up on his eyes, close up on her eyes, close up on his <laughs> eyes. And they were just like, oh my God, I'm so in love. Like the Little Mermaid. Oh. Yeah. Look at pictures, guys. I know. <laughs> I just like. I know. I'm not saying that like, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like. Everybody deserves to be loved. But just like, especially the pictures of her. Mm hmm through some of the stuff before we get to the trial, because my God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She looks like she crawled out of a fucking drain. Yes, she does. <laughs> yes, like... she does. And then later, we're going to talk about some letters written from Judy to Alvin. And she's like, my handsome husband. You have eyes though, right, Judy? You you have seen, oh, given him an ocular pat down. I mean, Ooh. Yeah, so. Somebody for everybody, I guess. Exactly. Um, so remember, Alvin was married at this time. He had children. Mm -hmm. But as soon as he met Judy, he divorced his wife, left his kids behind, and now it's just like him and Judy against the world, right? Judy saw Alvin's criminal lifestyle as very exciting, and they started committing crimes together. Now, very early on in their relationship, Judy became pregnant with Alvin's child. And then on July 14th, 1980, just a day before Alvin turned 27, 27, mm. he married Judy, who was 16 years old at the time. Oh, that is God. a fucking disgusting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, according to findlaw.com, the legal age to marry in Georgia used to be 16 with parental consent. D did Judy's mom say yes to this? Like, I, I don't know if she did. I would assume that parental consent could have just been, been easily forged. Yeah. Also, though, if she was pregnant, I mean, this was a time where 
you know. Yeah, it's like make an honest woman out of her kind exactly, of thing. Exactly, yeah. Um, so maybe her mom was like, well, you better get fucking married now. Like, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, used to be 16. Now it's 17. But the person has to be emancipated, has to complete a marital course, and cannot be marrying a person that is more than four years older than them. I mean, I guess that's good, better, but still. Yeah, better, <laughs> closer, warmer, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, once the couple married, they continued with their life of crime. They would go to town, or they would go town to town, robbing convenience stores and living in motels. I thought this was interesting. Was this the detective that said this? One of the law enforcement officers? There's a show. What was the show called? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's called Wicked Attraction. Thank you. It's called Wicked Attraction, as you well know. <laughs> and um, they have an episode on this couple. But one of the... I, ca- I can't remember if it was Catherine Ramsland or the, like, lady detective person. Right. I don't one know. One of them said, well, the couple at this time, you know, they're a young couple, right? They didn't have anybody, like, a grown-up around to tell them that their lifestyle <laughs> wasn't okay. So they just did whatever they wanted to. And I was like squeeze me he's 27 years old yeah he's the (laughs) grown-up like he doesn't need his mom to tell him that's not okay apparently he did apparently he did but like it was like i don't know it's almost like they just kind of lumped them in they were like well she was 16 and he was too no he was 27 years old he he knows right from wrong i mean she does too my god but yeah I don't think at any stage of my life that I would need someone to be like, hey, don't, uh, you know, don't rob people because I already know that yeah, that's, at gun that's point, bad news. I yeah. Think, like, yeah. Armed robberies. Come on. Like, mm-hmm. anyway, but, you know, whatever the situation, no grownups told them not to do that, apparently, during this time. <laughs> so they kept doing it. Um, and what if that was the argument? Like, well, nobody told me not to. Exactly. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, if nobody <laughs> told you not to, then I guess we gotta let yeah. it go, right? Right. And they were like totally addicted to it at this point. They're definitely like thrill seeking criminals. Mm. So as the couple continued on their journey of crime together, the fall of 1980 came and they were finally on the police's radar. Judy and Alvin were in Rome, uh, Georgia. I almost said Texas. I don't even know where I got that. Rome, Georgia, and decided to commit an armed robbery. So Judy is still only 16 years old at this time and she's pregnant. And she was arrested for trying to pass off a stolen check. And this is the day after the armed robbery occurred. And she she's nine months pregnant at this point. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. here's where, like, Judy, let's sit down and think about this. Okay, girl, I, I know that there are no ad- adults to tell you you shouldn't be committing armed robberies. Right. There's also no adults to tell her that being nine months pregnant and committing armed robberies is really, really, really fucking identifiable. <laughs> like, real fucking identifiable. Unless it's like a sugar and spice moment where you have a bunch of people who have a pregnant fake pregnant belly let's see she didn't do that but she did it yeah alvin did not have yeah that's true so see now you've gone and committed an armed robbery and then when people look at you and you are nine months pregnant they're like that's weird because everybody else in this lineup is not nine months pregnant right i mean how many nine month pregnant women are you going to find that you could put into a police line exactly (laughs) like come on right just Judy. And I mean, she's pregnant with twins. So pretty that's a pregnant. that's a pretty big belly. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would think. Right. But because of her age, she was put into the custody of the Rome Youth Development Center or the YDC. And you're going to want to remember about the YDC. Mm-hmm. So just two days after the robbery, Judy gave birth to her twins who were immediately put into the custody of Alvin's mother. Like, How was she even, I don't know. Maybe it's like when you're 16, your body can do anything. I don't know. I, I, I've never been pregnant, so I don't know what that's like, but. At nine months pregnant, I could barely get off of the couch by myself. Let alone commit a, an armed robbery, right? No. And then if I did get up off the couch by myself to go pee, presumably, I had to take a nap after I was so fucking tired. (laughs) Well, I have to do that. Just cause, you yeah, know? Like, and then like, and that 
when I was pregnant with Jesse, Ben was already, you know, what, two at that point by the time I was well, about depending to have on, Jesse? Well, Ben was two and a half about, just about when you're about to have Jesse. Mm-hmm. So he, <laughs> he would like go hide behind the couch or something if we were getting ready to go somewhere. He was just like, yeah, I don't want to go in it, you know, whatever. And I would be like, all right, bud, I'm going to come get you then. And he would say stuff like, you can't fit back here. And I'm like, you got me. I really can't fit back there. <laughs> um, but then, you know, he'd start running around and I'm like, okay, I'm going to come get you or you can walk, you know, like, which one do you want? And he would say, you're not fast enough to catch me. <laughs> and I'm like, you're right. I'm not. And if I did try to catch you right now, I would immediately have to lay down and take a nap. But one of these days, this child is going to come out of here and I'm going to get faster again. <laughs> like, what a little shit. I'm like, okay, yeah. Y- yeah, you got me there. Okay, you sure. Got, yeah, you but. got me there. Yeah, that's that's actually totally true right now. <laughs> but yeah, like, I just can't imagine. No. I know. And she's like just committing all the crimes. But I guess that's the pregnant. difference between, you know, she's 16, got all the energy in the world. And I was like I said, in my yeah. 30s and might as well just be on, like elderly. You're on Jesus. life support at that yeah. point. Yeah. So Alvin was also arrested for this crime and he was charged with accessory to armed robbery conspiracy to commit armed robbery, check fraud, accessory to check fraud, and conspiracy to commit check fraud. And he was sentenced to up to five years in prison. It's a lot of charges for just five years. But anyway, while the two were separated, Judy wrote letters to Alvin from the YDC and she would write him about complaints that she had about the staff there. She said that she detested them. She claimed that she was being sexually assaulted and raped and that the staff wasn't allowing her to write to him. She's literally in the process of writing to him. Mm -hmm. And she's like, guess what? They won't let me write to you. Yeah, in a letter that he clearly received. Right. Because they did let her write to him. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, in response, Alvin promised her that they would seek revenge when she was released. And this is these are the letters that I'm talking about where she's like, my handsome husband, my, I can't even remember what words she used, but she was very like, oh my God, you are the most good looking thing I've ever seen. I'm like, are we talking about the same Alvin? <laughs> yeah. I mean, all of the offense in the world because they deserve it grody i mean i don't get it yeah but anyway in november of 1981 judy was released from the ydc and once she was released she lived with alvin's parents and her two kids in cleveland tennessee and alvin got out shortly thereafter he was released from prison in april of 1982 and despite having been arrested and separated the couple immediately picked up where they left off Mm -hmm. like Ain't nobody going to break my stride. Ain't nobody going to slow me down. They would drive around in two separate cars, Alvin in his red Ford Granada and Judy in her brown Dodge. And they would communicate with the, the CB radio. He was referred to as Night Rider and she was Lady Sundown. Very uh, cool. This feels very much like a Harlequin romance novel. I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is up there with you can't give yourself a nickname. Like, gross. No, yeah. Yeah, because they pick pick those. Of course, yes. What? So now that they were back together, it was time that Alvin made good on his promise to get revenge on the YDC. And one evening in September of 1982, Ken Dooley was home alone while his wife and son were at a local theater in Rome. Robbie, his son, was auditioning for a part in the next production. At 7 p.m., the phone rang, and there was a woman on the other end of the line. When he picked up, she asked if it was Ken Dooley's house that she was calling, and he was like, yes, it sure is. And then she told him that her name was Susan, and she was a friend of Sherry's, this is his wife, from back in the day when they lived in Kentucky. And she told him that she was going to be in town, and she wanted to stop by to see her. He was like, that sounds great. He gives her directions to his house. He let her know that there was there would be a red Volkswagen and a green and white Buick in the driveway. Wow. I mean, what a different time. I know, right? <laughs> like just somebody, met you. Yeah, somebody calls and they're like, hey, I know your wife. I mean, she says the wife's name, but I don't know still. And she's like, I want to stop by. What is your address? And he's like, oh, how nice. Yes. Like, it was just a different time, man. Mm-hmm. Now, if somebody was like, what's your address? I'd be like, fuck you. You know. <laughs> right. If you that's even if you pick up the phone. <laughs> oh hell no. Yeah, I'm not picking up. Right. The phone. Absolutely not. 
At about nine that night, Sherry and Robbie made it back home and Ken let Sherry know that her friend called and was planning on stopping by. But Sherry was like, hey, guess what, Ken? I don't have a friend named Susan from Kentucky. Oops. Bum, bum, bum. Mm -hmm. A few days later, on September 10th, Ken returned home from work at the YDC. And upon arrival, Sherry told him that he had gotten a phone call from a girl that didn't identify herself, but was asking if he was home. Both Sherry and Ken assumed that it was somebody from the YDC and they would worry about it later because she said that she would call back. Yeah. As Ken was getting ready for bed that night, the phone rang and Sherry answered it. It was the same girl from before, but when Ken picked up the phone, he heard a man's voice that said, quote, you've screwed the last girl you're going to screw and you're going to pay. Ken demanded to know who it was on the other line, but instead he was just hung up on, which I find very rude. That's very rude. Right. Sherry asked who it was, but Ken was like, I don't know. They hung up. Ken made his way to the bedroom. He was checking on 11-year-old Robbie and three-year-old Carrie, who were both sleeping soundly, their children. And after he made it to his room, he heard four loud pops that sounded to him like a car backfiring on the street outside their home. But then he heard Sherry screaming that someone was shooting at their home. (sighs) Ken ran outside to see what was going on, but all he saw were red taillights driving down the road away from their home. So he immediately went back inside. He called the police. While waiting for the police to arrive, Ken walked through his home and found that two bullets had entered the house through the den walls. The other two shots hit the roof above the window of the den. When the police arrived, they collected all the bullets and canvassed the area, but there were no witnesses. They advised Ken to sleep somewhere else that night, but he was like, no, my kids are already asleep soundly in their beds. I don't want to have to wake them up. Like, the gunfire didn't wake them up. We're just going to stay. I mean, I mean, I like, I get being like, they're already asleep. I don't want to do this over again. But, like, also somebody shot him to your house. I know. I think that's worth the fight of getting them back to sleep, personally. I would say so, yeah. I'd to- be be in a safe place. I would fucking GTFO and be like, you can burn this bitch down. I ain't coming back here. (laughs) Well, I mean, luckily, so they didn't come back to his house, but the next day he told his supervisor at the YDC about what happened, but was advised to keep it to himself and not to worry the rest of the staff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Keep that to yourself, sir. Even though (laughs) other people could be in danger, let's not worry anybody unnecessarily. Okay, well, this is reminiscent of what was that uh, docu-series called? We covered it on our doc jams, but it was the McDonald's. um, Yes, 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 yes. Right? Uh, Don't pick up the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell anybody. And they were like, yeah, this happened, but we're going to pretend like it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. We're not going to alarm anybody else. Meanwhile, everybody else is having the same shit happen to them. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, don't tell anybody. You know, like, so nobody knows to be aware or to... Like, Like, hey, this is a scam. Yeah. Yes. Or like for the other YDC employees, like, you know. If somebody random is calling your home and asking for directions, it's not your friend from high school. Like. Right. Yeah. The next day, this is Saturday, September 11th, 1982, Linda Adair, this is another YDC employee, returned home with her husband around 10 p.m. after doing some last-minute shopping for their daughter's upcoming wedding the next weekend. The couple stretched out on the couch. They watched some TV before the be- uh-uh, before bed when the phone rang. This is a late night for them. How are they doing this? Even on a Saturday, I'm like, okay, I don't make it home at 10, no matter what. And I'm not gonna, no. if I do, let's say, in a crazy world that I did get home at 10. I'm not going to be like, well, what do I do now? The next step is sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Always sleep. Always, yes. Ideally, I would have been in bed for an hour and a half at that point. But anyway, Linda's husband, Gary, got up to answer the phone and a girl asked for Linda. And when she picked up the receiver, no one said anything and she hung up the phone. At about 11.30 p.m., still awake, Linda got up from the couch and headed into the kitchen to prepare a roast for Sunday dinner while Gary was in the shower getting ready for bed. These are some night owls. I know. She was like, while she was preparing the roast, the phone rang. And at the same time, she heard the noise of someone beating on her back door. And she's like, which one do I go to first? Do I get the phone? Do I figure out who's beating on the door? But she looked out towards her dining room and she saw yellow flames enveloping their carport. Then she realized that someone was still pounding on her back door and she saw a little boy there. I don't 
know if little boy is the right way to say this, but he, no. a, a boy. A boy, yeah. So then the phone rang again and she answered it this time. And it was her neighbor, Susan, telling her that someone had just thrown a bomb at her house. So she shouts for Gary. He came running through the house in his robe. The couple then stood outside their home with the boy who had come over to help. And then the police were called. The police questioned the Adairs and their neighbors and learned that the boy had just dropped his date off. And he saw the bomb explode just as a car flew past him going the opposite direction he was. And he told the police that it was a brown car with white or silver stripes that ran from the rear to the front of the car and that it was possibly... A Dodge Demon from the 70s? Dodge Demon. I could not believe that there was a Dodge Demon, and I Googled it, and damn show enough, (laughs) there was a car called the Dodge Demon. (laughs) I mean, the 70s were a wild fucking time, y'all. I know. I prefer a Ford Hellion myself. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. That boy said that there were two people inside, a white woman with long reddish brown hair in the driver's seat and a man in the passenger seat. And I, as Linda... Like, you, 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 there's people around. People can fucking see you. <laughs> You're not going to disguise yourself at all? No. Oh my. No, we are not, but thank you. Like, actually, she leaned her head out the window and said, I'm fucking Judy Neely, bitches. Like... <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> Try and catch me, bitch. <laughs> yeah, like, what the fuck, Judy? I know, mm-hmm. but... So Linda's still being questioned, and the phone rings, and when the caller confirmed that it was Linda who answered, she said, quote, I'm calling about the shooting at Ken Dooley's house last night, and... And then Linda cut her off and asked, what shooting? And before hanging up, the caller continued on and said, and the attempted firebombing of your house tonight, and you will both die before the night's over. My God. I know. She told the police about this call and connected this crime with the shooting at Ken's house. And then Linda went back outside or inside, excuse me, and called Ken. And neither of them knew who or what this could be about. So after she hung up with Ken, the police played a 911 dispatch call where dispatch. I didn't say that right. (laughs) I feel like a dispatch call. Yeah, I thought that was weird, but I wasn't going to make a big deal. (laughs) Where a woman said that she was calling about the shooting at Ken Dooley's house and the firebombing at Linda Adair's house. And she stated that it was for the sex abuse that she went through at the YDC. And Linda was like, yep, that's the voice uh, that called me earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, before the officers left, she told them that they would like both her and Ken to go to the station the next day. So after Ken and Linda... Both listened to the call. The investigators confirmed that the connection to the YDC or confirmed the connection to the YDC and looked into the caller's abuse claims, but couldn't authenticate any abuse and the case went cold. (sighs) Alvin and Judy, they're not done with the YDC. They're still mad as hell. So they hit the road again in their separate cars, making their way towards Macon. And apparently several months earlier, someone had referred to them as Bonnie and Clyde. And because they're just like super silly gooses, they were like, okay, we're going to call ours. Okay. So there was already like a Bonnie and Clyde. We're going to be Boney and Claude. (laughs) Boney and Claude. (laughs) It's so funny. Did they get like, I can tell class clown was the superlative here. I can tell. (laughs) That's, I don't care who you are. That's just funny shit. Yeah, funny. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, guys, I don't know. <sighs> As they made their way to Macon, they stopped at a drugstore to pick up some liquid Drano and liquid plumber, along with some syringes. Because while in prison, Alvin had been told that if you give people certain kinds of shots, the police wouldn't be able to tell that someone had been murdered. And Judy was still wanting to seek revenge on the YDC. So they made it to Bacon. They rented a hotel room. They were still thinking up some great ideas for revenge. But there was one that, you know, one idea that they decided on and was a good place to start. So Judy called a woman, Mrs. Allen, and told her that her husband was beating her up and she needed help. She asked her if she would meet her at the hotel. And Miss Allen or Mrs. Allen agreed to meet her at 530 the next day. So while they waited for 5.30 to roll around, they drove around Macon looking for John Brownlee's house. He was the security on the security team at the YDC. And they had a plan to, quote unquote, deal with him once they'd finished up with Mrs. Allen. But at 5 p.m., Judy received a call from the YDC saying that Mrs. Allen had to go out of town and she would not come to the hotel or motel. Also, you are leaving messages 
for this woman with a phone number to call back to. (laughs) Just not smart (sighs) behaviors. No. So, of course, Alvin and Judy were like, she is not out of town. Mm -hmm. So the next day, they drove to the YDC and they saw her car there. But since the plan with Mrs. Allen didn't work out, they decided to focus on John Brownlee. Judy called him up, flirted with him, saying that she wanted to meet him. But John Brownlee had gotten married a few months before that. And he was like, yeah, maybe we could meet up another time so my wife can come along. What a precious angel. I know. Botched, Mm -hmm. botched job. Mm Mm-hmm. So after she hung up with John, Alvin and Judy decided that Alvin would drop her off at John's home. When no one was home, she would go in through a window. She would let Alvin in. Then they planned to wait for the Brownleys to return. And once they did, they would knock John out. And when he came to, Alvin would rape his wife right in front of him. And then they would kill them. And they're like, this is an amazing idea. But they never ended up doing it. Yeah, they were like, I I don't know. Yeah. Mm, Never mind. So they left Macon and they went back to Rome, Georgia. So once they were back in Rome, Judy started approaching young women and girls as they were leaving shops. And she would approach them and ask if their name was Phyllis and if they wanted to go for a ride. And she had done this a few times and nobody took the bait. (laughs) I don't, I mean. (laughs) Like, hey, um, my name's Phyllis. Want to go for a ride? Like, no, I actually don't. (laughs) What? No. It's foolproof, right? (laughs) I don't, (laughs) I don't get it. But unfortunately, the couple was finally able to lure a 13-year-old girl on September 25th, 1982. Um, Okay. I was like, this is kind of long. Lisa Ann Milliken was born in 1969. She loved music and her sister-in-law, Cassie, married to her brother, Calvin, said that when Lisa's little sister was born, her mom said that she thought the baby was hers and took care of her. She was loving and enjoyed, quote, mommying her siblings. Even though Lisa was extremely nurturing, she was also said to be a, quote, tomboy who could hold her own with her boy cousins. Lisa's short life was not an easy one. She had been abused by her father starting at the age of 11. She was removed from her family home just a month before meeting Judy and Alvin and losing her life. Mm-hmm. She was initially placed in a home in, Ge- or in Rome, but then was transferred to the Harpst home in Cedartown, Georgia. She wasn't placed there because she was a delinquent, but because there was nowhere else for her to go. Lisa had been sexually abused by her father and the family's living conditions were poor. Lisa was described as being a loner, but it was she who persuaded the house parent to take the girls to the Riverbend Mall in Rome on September 25th, 1982. Gail Henderson brought the girls to the mall and upon arrival, took one of the youngest girls with her and told the other five girls to stay together while they were shopping. And they had an hour to go around the mall, do whatever they wanted to do, but they needed to meet back at the Radio Shack in an hour. And all of the girls made it to the meeting spot except for Lisa. Gail questioned the other girls about where she was, and they told her that Lisa had gotten separated from them. They waited a little while longer, hoping that Lisa would show up, and then Gail divided them into teams of two to look for her throughout the mall. After 20 minutes, all of the teams made it back to the radio shack without any sign of Lisa, and it was then that Gail decided to call the police. The police arrived. They did another search of the mall. No luck. They expanded the search to the surrounding areas, and an official... Mm-mm. Mercing persons. Yeah. (laughs) An official missing persons bulletin was sent to all officers, and police did believe that Lisa was a runaway. Shocking. Mm -hmm. At one point, because of her living situation, but the search for her was still on. Goodness gracious. So, three days later, on Tuesday, September 28th, an anonymous call came into the Rome Police Department. The woman who called asked if they were still looking for the missing girl, Lisa Ann Milliken. And she told the officer that she could tell them where to find her. She said, quote, go up to Little River Canyon in Alabama. Just as you cross the Little River Canyon Bridge, turn to the left, go up into the National Park. You'll see on the left some uh, picnic tables and a big rock parking area. And look off to the side of the canyon where there is a power line going across it. And look straight down the canyon and you'll find where I left her. So police in Rome notified the police in Alabama. They dispatched (laughs) several deputies along with an Alabama state trooper to the canyon. 
during you the bitch. initial search, they didn't find anything. So they call the police in Rome and they're like, that was a prank. Uh, Just so you know. This whole situation reminds me so much of Home Alone, right? When the <gasps> cop goes to and he's like, tell him to count the kids that, you know, there's oh, no uh-huh. one here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Tell him to count <laughs> the kids. Like, uh, is there, uh, you watch that in the 90s and you're just like, oh, okay. But like real, real stuff, guys. Like that's how it was. Yeah. Okay. So this woman had called, you can guess who the woman is, but she had called the Rome Police Department, but she had also called Jenny West, the news director of WRGA Radio in Rome. And so she told Jenny she had a news tip for her. She said the girl who'd run away from the Harps home had been killed. The Rome Police were covering it up. Okay. Okay. She told Jenny that Lisa was killed by a female juvenile officer from the Harps home and her body was in Little River Canyon in Alabama. And when Jenny asked how she was killed, she was told that she was shot, but she wouldn't tell Jenny, obviously, who she was. So Jenny immediately goes to the Rome Police Department and says, hey, I just got this call. The officers were like, are you, shouldn't you be like cooking something or, (laughs) I'm sorry. That's not good information. We already checked that out. Nothing was found. Okay. She's probably just a runaway and we're not covering up a murder. So why don't you go on about your day and do something else? Okay. Yeah. Go on, get. Yeah. The next day, the DeKalb County Police in Alabama received a call. The woman asked, did you find a body in the canyon? (laughs) It's not funny because we're talking about a murder, but I can see Judy being like, nobody else. I know, yeah, she's like stomping her foot like, oh my God, like how many times do I have to fucking call these people? (laughs) So she's like, did you find a body? And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? No. And so she's like, (sighs) okay, so she hung up. But then she calls again. And she's like, for the love of God, if you'll go out to the canyon where the power lines go across and look off, you're going to find a body with a bullet in it. And then she hung up again. (sighs) So the police department like whoever received this call calls the deputy and is like, listen to this shit. And then the phone rings again and it was the (laughs) same caller. And this time she says, if you want to know where a young girl's body is at, I'll tell you. She's not giving, I mean. No. She's like a dog with a bone at this point. Mm Mm-hmm. When asked where it was, she gave very precise directions. And once the call was over, four officers from the sheriff's office went back to the canyon. On the way there, they requested that state trooper Tommy Brock meet them there. So these men searched the canyon and initially found no signs of Lisa. But then state trooper Brock held his flashlight over the edge of the canyon and they saw the back of a young girl. You mean to tell me you guys didn't think to look over the fucking edge? Right. Once. And then, like, there's this girl who, I think she's from Alabama, too. Her name is Riley Lasseter, Laster, or something like that. She just, like, makes videos on social media. She's really funny. She's so country. But she has this one video where she's, like, talking about missing persons and how they're, like, you know, we sent, you know, we had the mom or whatever stay home in case you get a phone call or the kid comes home. And we sent the dad and the brother and the uncle and all that to look for him. And she's like, you sent the man to look for them? She's like, "Uh uh-uh. My husband can't find the fucking ketchup in front of his face in the refrigerator, okay? (laughs) My dad couldn't find the button to turn his camera around on his iPhone for three months. You think they're going to find anything? (laughs) Like, she's like, send my grandma who memorizes license plates for fun. Like, (laughs) send my friends who, you know, can find your boyfriend's side piece with just one, you know, initial. Like, it's, you know, yes. like, it's just, like, come on. <laughs> yes. It's so funny. Um, she ain't wrong, though. She ain't wrong. I mean, they, they've they been out here three times now. Right. And they didn't see, and Judy was like, I fucking told you where she is. <laughs> I'm sure the next, if she, they hadn't found her off after this call, she's like, oh, shit, I'll just come and show you yeah, where exactly. she is. Like, God. Like, Go. what the fuck? Like, I just... We didn't think to look over the edge, but okay. okay, okay. <laughs> Thank God Tommy Brock was there. Jeez. So uh, Lisa Ann Milliken's body was found on September 29th, 1982, 35 miles from the mall where she disappeared. So I guess she wasn't a runaway, dudes. 
Mm-hmm. There were puncture wounds visible on her neck along with a bullet hole in her back. About 50 feet from where her body was found, officers found a white hand tile to... Oh, whoopsie. No. What's a white hand tile? <laughs> it's nothing. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Uh, It's a white hand towel with a few hypodermic needles wrapped inside and a pair of jeans with blood on them. So uh, hang on. Y'all went out here three fucking times and you're like, I don't see nothing here. We didn't think the white hand towel with hypodermic needles had anything to do with it. We didn't think the the jeans with blood all over them had it. We didn't find none of that shit. Nope. We didn't see any of that. Nothing to see here. Oh, you wanted us to look down? I, I mean, I, look, I looked everywhere. I wasn't nothing there. Yeah, I didn't. Oh, my God. No, we were, we were supposed to look down. I didn't know that. Yeah. These items were collected for evidence and sent to the lab for testing while an autopsy was being performed on Lisa's body. The Rome Police Department and DeKalb County Sheriff's Office then joined forces to find out what happened to Lisa and who had done this to her. So they did confirm it was the same woman that had called both departments as well as the radio station. Because, I mean, she can't stop, can she? Nope. And as they continued working the calls, they determined that it was actually the same caller from the YDC shooting and firebombing as well. Because, again, she can't shut the fuck up. No. Because of this connection, they started looking into the girls that had been at the YDC that maybe were angry and had an axe to grind. Please tell me you started this process before Lisa Ann Milliken. Please. Absolutely not, no. Because she's she literally straight up said... This is exactly to do with my anger and axe to grind with the YDC. Well, yeah. And then she was like, Alvin, tell him. And then he was like, yeah, she's super fucking pissed at you guys. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to stop until everybody's dead. Mm-hmm. Specifically, the YDC is who we're mad right. at. Right. Yes. And they they weren't like, let's look through the names here. Mm-mm. They were like, well, I guess we should tell the YDC not to worry. Exactly. Must be totally unrelated. I don't know. As the police were searching for who it could be, the results of the syringe testing came back, and the substance found in the syringes was a combination of sodium, hydroxide, and hypochlorite. And these are the main ingredients in liquid drain cleaner. They also got the results of the blood stains on the jeans. So the blood was found to be Lisa's, but they were much too large to be her jeans. Remember, she's only 13. <laughs> so the assumption was that these jeans belonged to the killer. And remember, a woman has called 511 times now. (laughs) True. Yep. And she left her own damn jeans at the crime scene, right? Or the dump site. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You dumb bitch. Come on. Lisa's autopsy report determined that she was tortured prior to her death with six injections in her neck, arms, and both buttocks of the liquid drain cleaner. That is absolutely horrific. Absolutely Mm -hmm. horrific. This poor girl. And the autopsy also showed that Lisa had been raped. Police were questioning the staff at the girl's home looking for any clues into Lisa's life. And if it was likely that she did run away. Why are we still on this? I know. I mean, I guess, I guess what they're trying to determine now is, is there somebody she would have run away with that would have done this? But like, yeah, it doesn't matter if she ran away or not, she's been murdered. So like... Right. And I think that's what they mean by that is like, is there somebody who she would have run off with? But... uh, Anyway. Right. They were also still looking into who at the YDC could have been so angry that they would go on this crime spree. After looking through files, one girl stood out to investigators and that was 18-year-old Judith Neely. And the police were now looking for Judy and her husband, Alvin. Could we have done this before Lisa was murdered? Dude, I know. And like, it would not have been. I, I'm guessing it wouldn't have been that hard to have been like, hmm, sounds like Judy to me, you know? Like, I, I don't know. Like, because the way that they talked about it is when they started going through the records, Judy immediately jumped out to them. Mm-hmm. Immediately. Because they knew that Judy was traveling around with her husband, staying in random motels and get, and doing like, all kinds of crazy shit, right? So, like, yeah. this screams Judy Neely. And as right. soon as they did that, they were, on, like, on to her. <laughs> then on October 3rd, 1982, the Rome Police Department started receiving calls about a woman matching Judy's description attempting to pick up young women and girls. 
She had approached a woman named Diane asking if she was Patricia. And when she said no, the woman was like, that's fine. Do you want to ride around with me anyway, though? Because I'm pretty lonely. And Diane was like, no, thank you. (laughs) No. And so finally, this woman leaves her alone. Judy is not deterred, though, so she continues approaching girls until at last someone agreed to go driving around with her. So this is Janice Chapman, a 22-year-old Rome native, and her 26-year-old fiancé, John Hancock. They were walking home from visiting Janice's mother when Janice was approached. John had seen some, like, nuts and bolts on the ground and went, like, bent down to pick them up. And then a woman comes up to Janice. And so the woman said, hey, I'm from out of town. I'm lonely, you know. I'm riding around trying to make friends kind of thing. So she was hoping that the couple would like to ride around with her. And John was like, you know, we're just walking home. And so she's like, well, how about then I just drive you home? That's not that bad, right? Like, I'll just get you there right. faster. And so they kind of go back and forth for a little while. And they're like, okay, fine. You can give us a ride, like whatever. So once they're in the car, this woman starts contacting someone named Knight Rider over the CB radio. So then they decide they're all going to meet up and hang out. And so when they meet up, John goes in the car with Knight Rider. Janice stays with the woman in hers. And they decided they're going to go look for some moonshine to kind of liven up the night. The girls followed the boys until John tells the man driving, I need to go take a pee-pee, Okay. <laughs> so they all pull over. John steps out of the car and the woman steps out of her car and shoots him. What the fuck? Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Took a turn. Meanwhile, Janice is now restrained in the car. So the man and woman get into their respective cars. They drive off. What they didn't know, though, John wasn't dead. He waited until he knew they were gone. He gets up, he runs towards the nearest road, he flags down a truck driver, and he says, hey, I've been shot, I need help. They take him to the Gordon County Medical Center. He was treated for his wound. John was questioned by the police about what had happened, and they were initially very skeptical of his story. All signs are pointing to that fucking happened. I don't understand. He was shot. He, He was treated for a gunshot wound. Well, and I mean, I'm guessing because Judy has, she's a creature of habit. Mm -hmm. She probably shot his ass in the back. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? So. Exactly. I don't. Like, and then, so had they started looking for, he, he, he could tell them the cars. He could tell them what they look like. The fucking CB radio name that they used. Come on. They could have found these people that night. But because they were so skeptical, it wasn't until the next day that they took it seriously. Mm -mm. So they finally take him to the police department the next day, and he's walking by the detective squad room, and they're playing audio of a tape. And he says of a call that they got, because we know Judy can't stop fucking calling the police department. Right. And he's like, that's the woman that shot me. That's her voice. What are the odds, man? I mean, so... Now the police are like, oh, okay, well, now we need to now we need to get some information from you. We we actually weren't paying attention the first time you told us this because we thought it was a load of crap, but <laughs> tell us again and now we'll actually write this shit down. <gasps> so the Rome detectives were like, Can you identify the people? And he's like, Yes, I can. So they make a composite sketch and whatever. On October 6th, this is two fucking days later. Three days after it happened, two days after they took him seriously, Rome police had a photo lineup ready and John Hancock, along with Diane and another woman who had called about Judy, were asked to identify them and they all identified the same person. So now they're looking for Judith and Alvin Neely. And now the GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, have joined in. So now that they knew for sure they were looking for this couple, an officer goes to Cleveland, Tennessee with a warrant to search for the couple at Alvin's mother's home, but they were not there. On October 9th, the detective knocked on the door of a motel just outside of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. A woman answered the door, and when asked if she was Judith Neely, she said, yes, I'm she. (laughs) And she was told that they had a warrant for her arrest for passing bad checks. And And then Judy also said, I'm more pregnant than she. Mm -hmm. Here she is, pregnant again. So she's arrested. Three days later, Judy's husband shows up to visit her at the Rutherford (laughs) County Jail. This is my favorite part. You went to the, you went to the jail. 
<laughs> he's like, you know what? I don't think they're going to arrest me too. There's no reason for it. They didn't come ask for me. So I'm assuming I am good to go. And nobody, just, I don't remember at all anybody telling me not to do that. So it must have been okay. Well, sure. Yeah. If you don't have somebody explicitly telling you not to do something, then why the fuck would you not do it? Right. So I'm going to go to the jail where I could be jailed <laughs> because it's a jail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to assume that they're not going to arrest me. Except he walked into the jail and they said, boom, arrested. <laughs> they're like, we, did, we didn't even have to fucking look for you, man. Like, that you was came so to us. easy. It was like they had that Staples easy button. And they were like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Red Rover, Red Rover, send Alvin right over. And it did. <laughs> so on October 14th, the Rome Police Department was informed that both the Neelys were in custody in Murfreesboro. So several officers go up to Tennessee. They're searching their cars. They're searching the home of Judy's mother where they had been staying. They found guns, handcuffs, CB radios, motel receipts under fake names. Y'all, you're putting it all together. <laughs> uh, the letters that Judy had written to Alvin Weil at the YDC. Love letters. Uh -huh, being like, I'm so fucking mad at these people. You need to seek revenge on them. Yeah. But there was no sign of Janice. Um, okay. And now let's talk a little bit about Janice Chapman. Janice K. Chapman was born on September 24th, 1959 to Fred and Betty Morrow. John described her as having an easygoing manner. Um, she didn't really speak about her life a whole lot. When John met her, she was divorced and had two children who were at that time in the custody of their father. And John said that Janice was gentle. She was childlike. He loved to play games with her. For fun, they'd either, you know, drive or just walk around Rome. So back to the investigation. Once in Murfreesboro, Rome investigators questioned Alvin and Judy separately. During her interrogation, Judy was called. She showed no emotion. She did admit to picking John and Janice up. And she admitted to shooting John. What of it? <laughs> yeah. What's it to you? Yeah. She then described what she did with Janice. She said that they took Janice back to their motel in Rome where she shot her in the back. It's what, uh, just what Judy does. Yeah. She said that while Janice was laying on the floor, she was, quote, hollering. So she shot her two more times in the head. And then she also admitted to killing Lisa. She said they had taken her to a motel where they spent the night with her. She watched as Alvin raped the 13-year-old girl. Gee. Judy said that she tried to kill Lisa seven times with drain cleaner, but it just was not working. So then they took her out to the canyon where Judy had her stand at the edge, and then she shot her in the back. Lisa didn't fall over the edge like she thought she would. So Judy had to get on her knees and push her over. And that's when she got Lisa's blood on her jeans. So she took them off and threw them over the edge along with the syringes she had used to inject her. Wow. And I honestly, <laughs> and nothing was covered or anything. Mm -hmm. And one would think like, that's still out in the open, dude. Somebody's going to find that. Right. Not, nope. not even if you tell them exactly where to look. I know. Did they find that? I mean, my God. When Alvin spoke with the police, he initially told them that he didn't commit any murders. Mur Oh. oh, my goodness. Murders. <laughs> but he wanted to talk to his lawyer. So once his lawyer got there, they agreed that it was best that he make a statement. So he ends up corroborating Judy's story and admitting to raping both Lisa and Janice. On October 16th, 1982, Judith and Alvin Neely were extradited to Alabama to face charges for the murder of Lisa Ann Milliken. When she was being questioned in Alabama, Judy said that she was driving around with Lisa her two kids were with her in the car. Mm -mm. Judy was indicted on three charges of abduction with intent to harm, abduction with intent to terrorize and sexually violate, and murder. But get this, you guys. <laughs> Judy then applied for youthful offender status in hopes of avoiding a death sentence. Hmm. She wants to be all grown. And I do what I want. I'm a grown up. Right. Until she gets in trouble. And then she's like, but I'm just a little kid. <laughs> right. I don't know anybody. I didn't have a grown up telling me not to. Yeah. You can't be 
what you consider to be like a badass grown adult and also be a little damsel and just dis- mm-hmm. you can't do both can't ride two horses with one ass no. and she's gonna damn sure try mm-hmm. and if they had granted that the max sentence would be three years for her Jeez. for torturing uh, abducting and murdering people three mm-hmm. years but the prosecution was like I'll hold the fucking phone because listen to all this other shit that she's been doing okay and here are the details of this murder, you know? Like, this is this is really bad. So the court was, like, uh, denied as fuck, okay? No, yeah. Absolutely not. Judy's trial began on March 7th, 1983 in DeKalb County for the murder of Lisa Ann Milliken with jury selection. Then opening statements began on March 9th, and the media was given specific instructions on reporting and were granted the first three rows in the courtroom. All other courtroom rules were as they had always been, except that anyone passing through to sit in on the trial had to walk through with metal detectors. No exceptions. And this was a first for the county. And apparently a high school class even sat in to listen? That's pretty, I mean, I don't know. I guess high schoolers know that stuff like this happens, but like, I don't know. Yeah. I was kind of surprised about that. That would have been a cool day or a cool however many days if my class got to sit. Well, yeah. I mean, you know. Very interesting. Like, yeah, to mm-hmm. see how that process goes and yeah, all sure. of that. Yeah. When Judy walked into the courtroom, the prosecution was absolutely shocked at what they saw. She was actually put together. You she had guys. nice clothes on. I, yeah. Her hair and makeup were done. The the change. The change. She Mm -hmm. before routinely looked like she crawled out of a drain. Yeah. It's literally when you clean out your drain and the hair that you pull out, that's Judy. That's Judy. And then she walks in. They fucking like Eliza doolittled her. (laughs) Like she looks so put together. She talks completely differently. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, before she was always so sure of herself. Remember, she was the one calling the police department being like, have you found it yet? I did this. Have you found it? What's going right. on? Like, and now she's like demure and quiet and mean. Yes. And mild. Oh, come off it, girl. But her story changed as well. Yeah. Uh, now she's blaming everything on Alvin. Mm-hmm. Her defense strategy was that he masterminded the whole thing and she was being controlled by him. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So Judy took the stand in her own defense and the prosecutor said that when she bowed or she bowed her head and she sounded like she was crying, but the judge was like, lift your head up. And there were no tears. Mm -mm. After closing arguments, the judge ordered the jury to deliberate at 4.30 p.m. on Monday, March 21st, 1983. And it was... 10.45 the next morning when the jury returned with a verdict. Judith Neely was found guilty on all charges. In a vote of 10 to 2, the jury recommended a sentence of life imprisonment, but the judge was like, "Mm -mm, not on my watch. So he told Judy and the court, quote, the court finds by any standard acceptable to civilized society, this crime was heinous, atrocious, and cruel to a degree beyond that which is common to most capital offenses. Then after advising Judy to stand, he said, quote, accordingly, Miss Neely, the court hereby fixes your punishment as death. Darn. Yeah. He He didn't come to play. No, he said, if this don't deserve the death penalty, I don't know what does. And of course, that was the first time anybody saw her actually cry with tears. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Those were actual tears. Um, so you can't see the Judy is all. Oh, so you can put on makeup. Not that anybody needs to put on makeup to be pretty, but Judy, it's like, oh, so you can you can look presentable. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you can actually cry. Yeah, like whatever. And she's only eighteen at this point, so she was the youngest woman ever sentenced to death. Then she went to, she was sent to Georgia where Alvin was awaiting his trial and she was facing abduction and murder charges and the death of Janice K. Chapman and the kidnapping and attempted murder of John Hancock. To avoid another death sentence, Judy agreed to testify against Alvin in exchange for the state dropping the murder and attempted murder charges against her and allowing her to plead guilty to kidnapping. I do what? I can only think that they let her do this because she already had a death sentence somewhere else. Right. But because of what happens after this, I certainly wish they had not done this. Oh, 100%. She ended up being given a life sentence before returning to Alabama's death row. So Alvin pleaded guilty to the kidnapping and murder of Janice Chapman and was given two life sentences in 1983. 
In 1984, he filed a habeas corpus action where he stated that he had been suffering from high blood pressure and other medical problems, and he had not been feeling well during his confession. And he said, because of all that, his confession had not been given freely. And he also claimed that he had been coerced into entering pleas when, due to these medical conditions, he was unable to resist the coercions. Hmm. He said that he was under the influence of Darwin and had not been fully cognizant of the effects of his waiver by, of a trial by jury. And he added that his lawyer had not interviewed or subpoenaed witnesses as well as didn't file uh, for a change of venue. This motion was denied on July 16th, 1984. Darwin is apparently almost like a morphine pill. I oh, think? shit. Okay. Uh, God, I forgot about Darvisat. Oh, okay. So Darwin is the painkiller part. Darvisat is when you add the Tylenol in with it. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I'm guessing this is not a, I, I've never heard of this, so I'm guessing it's not a drug anymore. I don't know. Right. Yeah. So Judy and her attorneys filed for a new trial in April of 1983 on the basis that the jury four person was not paying attention. Uh-oh. Yep. They also allowed facts that, or allowed the facts of the Hancock and Chapman shootings in and the testimony of potential kidnap victims in Georgia and several other ridiculous factors. And um, this was denied on September 6th, 1983. I mean, you can't, you literally can't, you can't be like, but in this case, you also let other people who I tried to kidnap testify. That's not fair. Oh, yes, it is. Like, I tried to kidnap them. It didn't work out. Yeah. But did they get kidnapped? <sighs> yeah. So, like, that's irrelevant. <laughs> totally irrelevant. <laughs> oh, Judy. She filed several appeals in the years following her conviction, but all were denied. And then in 1999, Alabama's then governor, Fob James. I think it's pronounced Gob. <laughs> I don't, yeah. Um, Mr. James commuted her life sentence to, or her sentence to life with the el eligibility for parole. And he has apparently not ever given a reason why he did this. Why? He's not going to tell you. But also, Okay, so, but she has a life sentence in Georgia, too. Or a right. death sentence in Georgia. Which one did she get? Sorry, a life sentence in Georgia. So, isn't that supposed to, like, not matter? So, you shouldn't have parole, right? Because if they're, if they're supposed to be run even concurrently, right? Yeah. If you have, if you're not eligible for parole in, in Georgia, Georgia, then if she then if gets you get parole out, in Alabama, don't they just cart her ass over to Georgia? One would think, right? What I would think. I have no idea. It doesn't idea. seem that way, though. No, it does not. Because in May of 2023, Judith Neely was eligible for parole, and Governor Kay Ivey sent a letter to the Alabama Board of Pardons and Parole, strongly opposing her release, and she was denied parole. She's still in prison. Alvin Neely died in prison on October 24th, 2005, due to complications during a surgery. Uh, Judy and Alvin's children, April and Jeremy, these are the twins, were legally adopted by Jesse Lee Neely, Alvin's mother, and lived in Murfreesboro. Jason Alvin, who was born while Judy was incarcerated in Alabama, uh, was last living in Nashville. But, I mean, they're, they're living quiet lives. They're right. not trying to be connected to all this. Lisa Milliken's family fought for a law to be passed preventing felons in Alabama from profiting off of their crime. So this is Lisa's law. It was passed in 2019. That's a long ass time. Yeah. And doesn't allow for criminals to profit from books, movies, TV shows, or podcasts. Cassie Milliken married to Leeson's brother, Calvin. Oh, you said Leeson's. Did I? Yeah. Oh. Oh, maybe I did Lisa and Calvin together. Whoops. Married to Lisa's brother, Calvin, was the one leading the way for the bill and worked with Representative Prancy Robertson. Who's and naming Senator these Cam people Ward. in Alabama? I mean. Bob um, Prancy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But there you have it. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully Judy Neely is going to die in prison because she damn sure needs to. Yeah. But I just, I, oh, yeah, I don't understand what Fob was fucking thinking. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I don't, yeah, Idiot. I don't understand it. But I also don't understand, like, even if she gets parole, then 
then what happens to her Georgia sentence? Yeah, just take her ass to Georgia. I mean, my God. Yeah, and I don't know if that's what they would do, but... I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But it, it seems like not because the governor wrote a letter being like, please don't let her out. Like, so I just don't, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, I have no idea. That's it. That's it. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. We love you and we'll catch you on the next episode. Bye. Bye. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. Connect with us on Instagram or Facebook to continue the conversation. Thanks for listening and we will meet you back here next week. Bye. Bye. The theme song for the show is created and composed by Stephen Toby. You can find more of Stephen's work on SoundCloud. Our logo was created by Sloane Williams of Sophisticated Crayon. You can find more of her work on Etsy. Visit us at killerqueenspodcast.com for merch and other info about the show. 